On January 16, 2025, Starship's integrated test flight number 7 experienced an anomaly. During ascent of the second stage, around 8 minutes into flight, the vehicle's flight termination system was triggered, leading to a vast swarm of debris entering the atmosphere in a stunning visual display. Except what you're seeing on screen right now is footage from Flight 8. It happened again, and it might be time to ask one uncomfortable question. Could Starship have a fatal flaw? Hey there, what's up and welcome back to the Rocket Tub. My name is Philip and today we are covering whatever is going on with Starship lately. This will be a shorter than usual video given that this is about some fairly recent events, but there's a couple things I just might want to say about this whole situation. So let's start. Starship's seventh test flight was launched from SpaceX's Starbase test facility in the afternoon of January 16, 2025. The vehicle was supposed to follow the exact same flight trajectory as the previous six flights and included the second ever landing attempt of a super heavy booster. However, the vehicle itself was drastically different from the six Starships that had been launched before, as Ship 33, our excellent vehicle, was the first V2 Starship. The second generation of Starship, often just called V2, features a slightly lengthened tank section as well as a shorter payload bay, trading it for up to 25% more internal propellant mass. The entire ship has grown from 50.3 to 52.1 meters, with the entire stack now standing at 124.4 meters tall. It also received an upgraded bulkhead design as well as redesigned propellant distribution lines. From the outside, the most notable change, however, are probably the new forward flaps, which are a lot smaller on the V1 ships and are positioned further leeward. Ship 33, featuring all of these changes, successfully completed liftoff, stage separation, second engine startup and the first few minutes of burn time. The first indication of trouble occurred at T plus 7 minutes and 39 seconds when engine number 1, a sea level raptor on the center cluster, experienced a catastrophic failure. The engine likely exploded, leading to a large fuel line that transfers some liquid methane to the outer engines, springing a leak. Due to the propellant access lines of the engine being damaged, the methane mixes with liquid oxygen and ignites, causing a fire in the engine bay. In the following seconds, the fire damages the surrounding engines, first causing an almost simultaneous shutdown of another sea level engine and the neighboring vacuum engine, and later on to the shutdown of all but one vacuum engine. We sadly don't have a lot of video material of this happening, but flames can be seen coming from the right hand aft flap hinges on the SpaceX broadcast, and we have this low quality image of the fire in the engine bay with one engine clearly destroyed. Loss of signal finally occurred at T plus 8 minutes and 26 seconds. The flight termination system seemingly didn't trigger until around 11 minutes into flight when the ship left its designated flight corridor. Vehicle breakup occurred at an altitude of around 75 kilometers above the Gulf of Mexico near the island chains of Turks and Caicos. The debris subsequently re-entered the atmosphere with most heavier pieces burning up and falling into the ocean. An emergency protocol had to be triggered to lock down some of the airspace in the region to avoid the debris cloud impacting air travel in the area. Many smaller pieces, mainly from the thermal protection system, were found on land or washed ashore several Caribbean islands in the following days. SpaceX's official statement claimed that a harmonic response several times stronger in flight than had been seen during testing had caused the engine failure. Yep. The most likely cause is the good old pogo effect, a combustion instability issue as old as rocketry itself. The FAA mandated a mishap investigation following the loss of the vehicle and grounded Starship for the time being. Despite the failure of Flight 7, it only took 49 days until the launch of Flight 8, which happened in the afternoon of March 6, 2025. 
Once again, the flight followed the expected trajectory, passed all major milestones until stage separation, after which the Super Heavy booster conducted yet another successful landing. However, the ship once again ran into trouble. At T plus 8 minutes and 4 seconds, an explosion tore through the engine bay once again, leading to all engines except for one shutting down almost immediately. The cause of this explosion was most likely an engine failure once again, just like on Flight 7, but way more violent. On the few pictures we have of the engine bay during the event, we can even see one of the vacuum engines, as that particular engine can be seen having a burn through down its nozzle, as well as the orange glow of a fire near its base, completely missing from the engine bay, along with at least parts of two more center engines also missing. The explosive failure of the engine seems to have been so violent that it blew half the engine bay off the vehicle, ejecting multiple engines out into the upper atmosphere. Following the detonation, Starship immediately lost attitude control and began to spin rapidly, losing more parts to the forces involved. Telemetry was lost around T plus 9 minutes and 35 seconds and the ship broke up soon after, leading to yet another debris cloud re-entering the atmosphere above the northern Caribbean. As air traffic was impacted once again, the FAA grounded Starship and mandated another mishap investigation, although that grounding might not last very long as SpaceX's CEO, who now appears to be America's unelected shadow president, has basically killed the FAA. But regardless of what it was exactly, the fact that two flights in a row experienced near-identical failures is worrying. The V2 variant of Starship currently has a success rate of, well, 0%, despite the V1 ship having had four successful launches in a row after the initial two attempts. It might genuinely be at the time to ask an uncomfortable question. Is there something seriously wrong with Starship? Okay. Admittedly, calling Starship a lost case or a failed project after just two failed launches might be a bit of an overreaction. After all, SpaceX has already bounced back from such or even worse scenarios before, including with Starship. However, these earlier instances occurred under vastly different circumstances. Something similar hasn't happened after multiple successful launches, at least not in a very long time. Well, we don't know exactly why that is, and seeing SpaceX's trend towards less and less transparency, we probably never will. But whatever the technical causes of the two accidents might have been, the true issues, at least in my highly uneducated opinion, lie way deeper. Starship's main issue, the one that it has been battling with for the past few years and has indirectly caused the failures by spawning the V2 variant in the first place, is performance. In its current form, even if V2 was reaching orbit consistently, Starship is drastically underperforming compared to the design goals that have been quoted over and over again. In pretty much every single update or presentation, Starship's target performance values have been stated as being able to deliver 100 to 150 tons of payload into low Earth orbit while flying in reusable mode with both stages returning to the launch site with higher numbers available in an expendable configuration. They still claim that on their website to this day. However, we are quite confident that that actually isn't the case. The real performance of Starship as it is right now is somewhat hard to figure out, since we are missing a lot of information. It has been stated that the V1 ship, which was also initially aiming for a payload capacity of 100 to 150 tons, was only capable of a meager 40 tons. For V2, we haven't got any information except the same design goal number. But by using our old friend, the rocket equation, we can get a rough idea of what we're looking at. In order to use this equation, we unfortunately need some values that aren't publicly released. But for most of them, we have pretty good estimates. To properly solve the rocket equation for payload mass, we first have to rearrange it like this, with wet mass isolated on the left side. We do that because it's going to tell us whether Starship is capable of getting the claimed payload into orbit using the propellant capacity it has. In order to calculate that, we need to know a couple things. 
First of all, we need the effective exhaust velocity, which equals specific impulse times standard gravity. Starship has three sea level raptors, which all have an ISP of around 350 seconds, as well as three vacuum engines, which are at around 380 seconds. So the average ISP of Starship is likely around 365 seconds. With those values, we get an exhaust velocity of 3580 meters per second. For delta v, or how big of a change in velocity Starship has to achieve, we need to take a quick look at its flight profile. To get to a low Earth orbit, any vehicle is required to achieve at least 9.4 km per second of delta v. Orbital velocity is a bit lower at 7.8 km per second, but we do have to account for gravity losses, which is why the true delta v requirement is a bit higher than that. As seen during flight 7, Stage separation occurs at a velocity of roughly 4400 km per hour, which equals just 1.22 km per second, which is pretty slow compared to other vehicles, mostly due to Super Heavy having to return back to the launch site and not landing somewhere in the ocean, as on Falcon. Since most of the gravity losses have to be overcome during the first stage burn, we can estimate that Super Heavy has already overcome somewhere between 2 and 2.5 of those 9.4 km per second, so an estimated delta V requirement of 7 km per second is quite reasonable for Starship. Lastly, Starship's end of burn mass consists of vehicle mass, the mass of the remaining propellant needed for the orbiting and landing, as well as the payload. Starship's dry mass likely sits around 120 to 130 tons for V1 ships, and since V2 ships are a bit larger but also feature some weight saving measures, a vehicle mass of around 130 tons is reasonable. As for the remaining propellant, not much is needed, which is why I set that to 15 tons. Add in the claimed propellant ceiling of 150 tons, and we get a total mass of 295 tons. Once we've calculated the wet mass, we run into a bit of a problem. Our result for wet mass is 2085 tons. Deducting our assumed dry mass, which is included in this figure, we get required propellant mass of 1790 tons. That exceeds the officially stated maximum propellant mass of a V2 Starship, which is 1500 tons, by 290 tons. Therefore, a payload of 150 tons is currently not possible. If we lower the payload mass to 100 tons, we land at a wet mass of 1730 tons and a propellant mass of 1485 tons, which combined with the 15 tons we assumed are needed for returning, is exactly within the 1500 ton capacity. That means that in a best case scenario, a V2 Starship is going to be able to put 90 to 100 tons into a low Earth orbit. Don't get me wrong, that's still a lot, but it's over 50 tons short of the design goal and it's kind of worrying that the V2 ship, which only exists due to V1 ships underperforming outrageously, still can't match the design goals originally imagined for V1 ships. As you can see, Starship does have a massive performance problem. And that mainly comes from one number, dry mass. Starship in its current form is just way too heavy for what it is meant to do. And that has multiple technical reasons, like the heat shield unexpectedly growing. But the real reason that for that might just be company culture and philosophy. I admit, this claim might sound weird, but bear with me. You see, many of the design decisions that were made during Starship's development up until now were aimed at speeding up the development process. For example, Starship was once meant to be constructed from carbon compound materials, but that was later switched to stainless steel because it is cheaper, allows a faster manufacturing process and is more adaptable for design changes. However, it also adds mass. SpaceX has made multiple such decisions including mounting a secondary ablative heat shield instead of improving the primary one, because it's faster. These and many other decisions, meant to speed up progress, have led to technical compromises that are slowly beginning to negatively impact the program. Yes, these decisions most likely had very little influence on whatever technical defect caused the failures of Flight 7 and 8, 
But as SpaceX hadn't rushed the development of Starship that much and slowed it down by just a little bit, there most likely wouldn't ever have been a need for a V2 ship in the first place. And that weird sense of urgency also leads to other problems. Since Starship is so much overweight, it technically would need a severe design overhaul to improve its dry mass. But since that would, once again, cause more delays, SpaceX's solution seems to be pushing Raptor even further reducing its mass and increasing both thrust and efficiency at the same time. And while that could theoretically work, it again has some side effects. Being the world's first full-flow stage combustion engine, Raptor already is insanely complex and operating at nearly unmatched performance levels. Squeezing even more out of such an engine is not only an unviable long-term solution, as you just can't do that indefinitely, but it also causes some unforeseeable reliability issues, problems with combustion instabilities and more. And seeing how both Flight 7 and 8 had severe engine problems, this might actually be one of Starship's core problems right now. However, you might now, rightly so, jump straight to my comment section and tell me that my SpaceX is following a learning by doing approach. And that's true. On earlier flights, SpaceX learned lessons and implemented upgrades and fixes for the next launch. But seeing just how fast the program has been going lately, I have my doubts that this is still happening. At the time that Flight 7 blew up, Ship 34, the one slated to launch for Flight 8, was already built and began pre-flight testing shortly after. And guess what? Ship 35, the one scheduled to launch on Flight 9 in the near future, had already been completed by early February and rolled out to the pad just four days after the failure of Flight 8. That little time between launches just doesn't allow for basically any design changes. And that leads me to either one of two conclusions. Either SpaceX knew the issue that doomed Flights 7 and 8 and already fixed them for Flight 9, which means they launched fully knowing there was a serious issue with the vehicle, or they just didn't fix these issues at all. At least to me, both options seem utterly nonsensical, and in both cases, at least two flights were completely wasted as no progress could be made. There is a slim chance that vehicle-specific quality assurance problems like we have observed before were to blame for both failures, which would clear Flight 9. But then again, why is Starship's production so rushed that these high error rates are occurring? Well, in my eyes, SpaceX has accelerated Starship's development so far that they're starting to waste resources and time on launches that have no real hope of succeeding. Starship has had some troubles in the past, and until now has overcome all of them. But this case seems different, as company culture might be directly to blame. Changing that, admittedly, is hard. But if they want to get Starship to work and prevent it from having a fatal flaw, they really need to slow down. And that's already it for what I believe is going wrong with Starship lately. Tell me down in the comments whether you believe I'm right or a totally different scenario is going on. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like and subscribing to the Rocket Hub. I really appreciate your support. For those who are going to be here the next time, I've been working on a very special one for the last couple months and it's coming up shortly, so stay tuned. We see ourselves next time and until then, I'm out. Cheers!